question, have we understood baptism correctly? And yesterday we indicated that the answer to that is an emphatic yes, we have understood baptism uh, correctly. This morning we want to look at the question, what do early Christian art and archaeology reveal about baptism? The lesson yesterday looked at the literary evidence for the Christian doctrine and practice of baptism in the centuries after the New Testament. The historical evidence is a strong argument for the correctness of the position of Churches of Christ on baptism. This does not make church history our authority. The New Testament is. But the historical argument is a powerful support for our position. What do I mean by a historical argument? There are two aspects. One is the chronological consideration. Those who lived closest to New Testament times were in the best position to understand its teachings. This does not mean that they could not make mistakes. They did. But their testimony about Christian faith and practice is an important voice that needs to be heard. A second aspect concerns historical methodology. In historical interpretation, one must explain how you get from point A to point B. If the New Testament is point A and early church history is point B, one must be able to explain how one gets from the New Testament church to the situation in the second and subsequent centuries. If one knows what point B is, which is our study in this series of lessons, what the early church was in the second to fourth centuries. If one knows what point B is, then one's understanding of point A, the New Testament, must be such that one can get from there to B. Some people's understanding of the New Testament is such that you can't get to B from there. Our understanding of the New Testament is such that you can explain the connection between the New Testament and later developments. Well, today we turn from the literary to the visual evidence. Those who disagree with the conclusions I have presented from the literary evidence often claim that the art and archaeological evidence point in a different direction. We'll examine the visual evidence in order to treat that claim. I begin with the depictions of baptism in early Christian art. And we will group the material according to the different kinds of art. And we begin with the frescoes in the catacombs of Rome. The earliest Christian art begins in the early third century. And this uh, uh, wall painting is from the crypt of Lucina in the catacomb of San Calisto. It's dated to the early third century. It is probably the earliest surviving picture of baptism. And the moment depicted is Christ coming up from the water in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. The water is uh, sketchily uh, shown, but uh, surrounds uh, him. Uh, the dove is over his head, approaching him, and John is on the bank receiving Jesus as he comes from the water. I rather wish this type had caught on, but there is only one other example of it in Christian art, and it is poorly preserved. 
If some of you toward the back would like to move forward, feel uh, free to do that so that you can see the pictures more clearly and perhaps hear uh, better since we have to compete with outside uh, noises. The second uh, fresco from the catacombs I want to show you is also from San Calisto and dated to the third century. This represents the standard iconography with the hand of the administrator on the head of the one baptized. The hand on the head was the moment of the confession of faith as we learned from the literary sources yesterday. But the hand on the head was also functional for an immersion. Uh, you will notice the uh, nudity of the candidate and that uh, Christ is here shown smaller than John. In ancient art, the more important person is shown larger. Why then is Christ smaller than John? The smaller size and the nudity may point to the new birth motif. But another factor, as the church fathers stressed, is that Jesus' baptism showed his humility in his identification with humanity. And perhaps our artist is reflecting that theological point, uh, that Christ humiliated himself in adopting the human condition and in submitting to baptism. He identified himself with humanity and assumed a lower position. It is hard in a still picture to depict an immersion. There were not video cameras in the ancient world. But note that a spray of water surrounds the body. Later art was more successful in suggesting an immersion. The baptismal scene here is flanked on one side by the healing of the paralytic and on the other side by a fisherman, both of which scenes had baptismal interpretations in the early church. Now another scene from uh, San Calisto, also 3rd century, and uh, I show this picture in order to indicate the context of the baptismal scene which we will look at in a moment. But uh, this uh, picture is a reminder to us that the catacombs were burial grounds. Uh, they were not hiding places, they were not places of assembly, their location was well known uh, by the uh, authorities. And uh, Christians decorated their tomb areas in the way that other people in the ancient world did, except that they used uh, Christian scenes uh, rather than uh, pagan art. Now the next picture is a detail of that uh, preceding picture. And notice in this that the one baptized is leaning forward. Uh, is this the artist's ineptitude or is this the actual depiction of the mode of immersion? We noted yesterday some of the literary evidence that the immersion was accomplished by bending the body forward, uh, leaning the head under uh, the water rather than our usual practice of a backward horizontal uh, immersion. But uh, it was an immersion. Uh, but uh, the method that was common in the ancient world seems to have been leaning uh, the person forward uh, to dip under the water. And uh, it may be that uh, our artist here, instead of being inept, is actually quite adept at uh, showing uh, a baptismal uh, scene. Now a painting in the catacomb of uh, St. Pietro e Marcellino Mar uh, from the 4th century. This is a picture that is often 
argued as showing a pouring or a sprinkling because of the rays that are coming down uh, from uh, uh, the dove, very much distorted now in the passage of time. But notice that the hand of the administrator is on the head of the one being baptized. The body of the administrator has uh, deteriorated and uh, no longer visible, but you can still quite clearly see the forearm and the head rest, hand resting on the head. So the administrator is not pouring or sprinkling anything on the head of the person. The rays coming down from the dove may be water, and so surrounding the body as in an immersion. Or those rays may be a symbol of grace. They may represent light, and so reflect that motif of illumination that we talked about yesterday. Or they may be the anointing oil uh, that uh, accompanied a baptism in the liturgy by the third century and the fourth. Or the rays may be a symbolic representation of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, all of these interpretations have been advanced for the interpretation of this uh, picture. Uh, we do not actually know uh, what the artist had in mind, but I mentioned these various interpretations in order to indicate that it is not at all evident that this is meant to represent a sprinkling or a pouring uh, for the baptism. These rays coming down from the dove and surrounding the body of the one being baptized uh, may represent or symbolize something quite different. Let's turn now to another medium of art, a sculpture. Here we will have to do with the uh, sarcophagi. The Greek word uh, sarcophagus means a flesh eater. It is the ancient word for what we would call a coffin uh, where the body was deposited. And uh, often these uh, stone sarcophagi were adorned with uh, sculpture. And uh, beginning with the late third century, we have examples of Christian uh, sarcophagi. Uh, this uh, first one is located in the church of Santa Maria Antiqua. It is dated to the uh, late third century. It's found in a church on the Roman Forum. Uh, the scenes from the left to right are the uh, story of Jonah, Jonah being uh, thrown to the sea monster and then uh, reclining under the gourd vine. A figure in the posture of prayer, in art studies this is called the Orons. This was the symbol of prayer in the ancient world. Uh, for us, I think the symbol of prayer is Durer's praying hands. But uh, in the ancient world, if an artist wanted to depict prayer, and this is true of pagans and Jews as well as Christians, uh, the posture was this, and it's known as the orons, or the praying uh, figure. Then we have a, a teacher with his scroll, a good shepherd, and then on the right side of the front of the sarcophagus, a baptism. The baptism has the standard features, a small nude with the hand of the administrator on his head. There is an allusion to water coming only to the ankles, not an actual depiction of the quantity of water. If it is hard to show an immersion in a painting, there is a greater difficulty in sculpture. But uh, later examples in ivory carving uh, succeeded better. Early Christian art was more a matter of illusion than of realistic depiction. On the ends of, the, of this uh, sarcophagus, on uh, the left hand side, is a sea god pouring water out of a jar. And on the right hand side, a fisherman. 
Now, I, I hope that you can tell by looking carefully that in the baptism there is the same level of water as on the left side depicting the sea monster who swallowed Jonah. So there's no effort to be realistic. However much water was necessary for Jonah to be thrown overboard and to be swallowed by a sea monster who's swimming in the sea, the same amount of water that is shown here is shown for the baptism. And also the same level around the corner for the fisherman who is fishing. So uh, there is not any effort to be realistic. The artist is simply alluding to the presence of water. And if there was enough water for a sea monster here uh, to be swimming around in the deeps, there is a, enough water for a, uh, a baptism. And so, although a lot has been made of the very shallow level of the water in this picture, I think we can't draw conclusions as to what the author understood the action of baptism uh, to be. He's doing a symbolic uh, picture. And the same level of water that the sea monster is in is uh, the level of the water in the baptismal scene. Now another fairly, fairly early depiction of baptism on a sarcophagus is on one that comes from the Via della Lungara in Rome. It's now in the uh, Museo Nazionale Terme in Rome. It is dated to the late 3rd century. This scene is the left side of a rectangular sarcophagus. There is a tree of life on the left that is just barely shown in this uh, picture, uh, uh, pl a tree planted by rivers of water. Uh, the book in the administrator's hand indicates the role of instruction that accompanied baptism. And then on the right, uh, quite visible in this picture, is the dead tree. Well, the, a dead tree and a live tree, is this an allusion to John's preaching of uh, the axe lies at the root of the tree? Or does it symbolize the passing from death to life? On the front of this uh, sarcophagus is a fisherman, a praying figure, and a good shepherd, all of which scenes often are associated with uh, conversion and salvation. Now I want to show you a different kind of picture that is not actually a depiction of baptism, but it shows water flowing from a rock. Uh, this. Uh, Fragment of a sarcophagus comes from the end of the third century. It's in the Museo Pio Cristiano in uh, the Vatican. Uh, but this water descending from the rock is not pouring on a candidate. You'll notice these small figures drinking the water. This is a depiction of the water from the rock in the story of Moses uh, in the Old Testament. But uh, this scene was given a symbolic interpretation in reference to baptism uh, in the early church. Now turning from a sarcophagus to an engraving on a gravestone at Aquileia. Uh, this is a 4th century uh, scene. Uh, nearly all pictures of baptism are arguably the baptism of Christ. But, but this seems to be a girl. Uh, the inscription accompanying the scene is, To innocent whose spirit the Lord chose, rest in peace, a believer, August 23rd. Or the dating formula would have the equivalent of August 23rd in our calendar. What do the lines represent again? We have the same options as in the catacomb painting. This gravestone commemorates apparently an emergency uh, baptism of a child. Now relating to uh, sculpture would be the ivory carvings. 
Uh, I want to show you two of these that are in the British Museum. Uh, this one is from the year uh, 450 or thereabouts. On the right hand side, Jesus is in the temple when he was 12 years old arguing uh, with the leaders of the Jewish people. And then on the left we have a baptism of Jesus. The water here comes to his knees. Uh, there is an angel witness added to the scene here. And something is flowing from above. Does this allude to the doctrine of being born from above? Uh, the next uh, British Museum ivory carving is dated to the 6th century, comes from Egypt. We have the hand in the sky representing the hand of God. That was a common way of indicating the presence of God in both Jewish and uh, Christian art. And I, I rather like that uh, symbolism, the, the hand of God. The dove representing the Holy Spirit and then Jesus. Well, this is a more realistic uh, depiction of the action of uh, baptism. The most uh, spectacular representations of uh, early Christian art are mosaics. This scene is from the uh, baptistry of the Orthodox, built under Bishop Neon of Ravenna, in the middle of the 5th century. The mosaic became damaged over time and in the late 19th century it was restored. And you can easily tell the restoration area by the difference in color. I hope the picture isn't too washed out uh, uh, for you, uh, but there is a definite a change in the color which shows the restoration area and it included the uh, head of John the baptizer and uh, his hand pouring something out of a vessel on, uh, on Jesus and the head of Jesus also is part of the restoration uh, area. Well this uh, scene has often been reproduced as representing an an ancient depiction of pouring uh, in baptism. But the pouring is the work of the 19th century restorer, uh, not the work of the original uh, artist. A new feature in this uh, mosaic is the presence of the river god, a personification of the river Jordan. And this was a common feature uh, in ancient pagan art to depict uh, elements of nature in a, uh, as a deity and in human form. Now next the baptistry of the Arians, also from Ravenna in about the year 500, and this is the scene that we used for the cover of my book on baptism in the early church. This baptistry copied the baptistry of the Orthodox, but it was much less elaborate. However, it is significant because it shows what's the, what the original iconography of its model was. And here the hand of the administrator is on the head of Jesus, as was common in early Christian art. And uh, the original in the baptistry of the Orthodox would have shown the same thing and not John pouring uh, water but the hand on the head which served as the moment of confession but was also functional for an immersion. Uh, a later mosaic now from the monastery of Daphne outside Athens from the 11th century and I show it in order to point out the continuity in Eastern Greek Byzantine art with early Christian art. Uh, this is quite typical of the Byzantine pictures of uh, baptism and here the indication of an immersion is uh, quite uh, obvious. Now another medium of art is that of manuscript illumination. The art historians call it, I suppose we would say manuscript illustration. 
These are miniature paintings that uh, decorated manuscripts. From the Rabula Gospels, a Syriac Gospel text, uh, now in Florence, from the 6th century. Here again we have the Trinity represented, the hand of God, uh, the dove of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. Uh, the new feature in uh, this uh, uh, miniature is the presence of a flame of fire on the water. The presence of fire at the baptism of Jesus is frequently mentioned in early sources, especially Syriac sources. The presence of fire represented a theophany, that is, an appearance or manifestation of God. Uh, remember the burning bush and the call of Moses, or the tongues of fire that rested on the apostles in Acts 2. Uh, fire represents the presence uh, of God, a, a theophany. And uh, the scene of the baptism of Jesus thus is seen and represented as a divine uh, manifestation because that is the occasion when God acknowledges Jesus as uh, his son. Now a later uh, manuscript from Armenia, an Armenian manuscript, this will give you one form of Eastern representations of uh, baptism. A Byzantine manuscript now from the 12th century indicates that the traditional representation of baptism continues. Uh, Eastern churches still today practice immersion. They immerse infants, but uh, their understanding of baptism is still an immersion. And now I want to show you one late Western manuscript, an Italian manuscript of the 14th century. Uh, by this time, it was common to show baptism as a pouring because that had become a common practice. But an immersion continued to be portrayed even in the Western church, uh, which had adopted pouring as a more common practice. And uh, this late manuscript indicates that artists were still, on occasion at least, uh, preserving uh, the ancient uh, style of representation. Now a few words of conclusion on the art. There is no ancient depiction of baptism showing the administrator pouring or sprinkling water on the one being baptized. Where the water is shallow, the purpose is to allude to the presence of water and not to give a realistic representation. The hand on the head is a common characteristic of the baptismal scenes, and that was the moment of confession, and thus shows the centrality of faith or baptism. Moreover, there is no depiction of infant baptism in the early art. The smaller person is still a grown person, shown smaller for symbolic reasons. Now we turn from art to archaeology to look at some of the early baptismal fonts. In architectural studies, the word baptistry refers to the building and the actual place where the water is held is called a font or a piscina, the Latin word for a fish pond, or pool. Uh, we use the word baptistry for the place where the immersion takes place. But in art and archaeological studies, and architectural studies, baptistry refers to the building that contains that pool. And a different word, thought, or piscina is used for the baptismal basin. I'll try to observe that uh, architectural terminology, but I may slip into our usual uh, terminology, but I wanted you to understand uh, the difference. The earliest certainly dated baptismal font comes from Dura Europus on the Euphrates River 
in eastern Syria. It belongs to the decade of the 240s in a house church, a house that the Christian community there had acquired and uh, remodeled for church purposes. And one room is uh, the baptismal room. And uh, that uh, room has been reconstructed at the Yale University Art Gallery and that is what is depicted in this picture. For the dimensions of the font, and uh, all of my dimensions are in meters because that is what the uh, literature uses. And uh, to help you appreciate the significance here, a meter is almost exactly uh, three feet three inches. That's uh, close in our, in our measurements. So a meter is a little bit more than a yard. And perhaps you can make the transfers now yourself, although I'll be giving, in most cases, the dimensions uh, in meters. The east and west sides of the font were 1.63 uh, meters, so five uh, feet approximately. Uh, the north and south sides are not identical uh, in, in length. The north side is just under a meter, the south side just over a meter. And uh, the depth is 0.948 meters, so about uh, uh, three feet or just a little less than three feet. It is sometimes argued that this font was too small for an immersion. But I think those who make that argument are thinking in terms of the practice of a horizontal immersion where you lay the body uh, out flat uh, all the way. Well, even that would have been possible, I think, on the diagonal of uh, this baptismal font. When we remember that uh, people were shorter then, than most of us are now. But the size of this font was certainly ample for a forward immersion. And uh, I think we might ask the counter question, why was this large of a font built if you were only going to pour water? Now let's look at some of the later baptismal fonts. Uh, this is one that if you have made tours to uh, these seven churches of Asia or a Mediterranean cruise, you may have seen this is in Ephesus, uh, the Church of the Virgin Mary. Uh, the baptistry is uh, an octagon. Uh, it belongs to the uh, fourth or fifth uh, century. And the uh, a person in the uh, uh, pool shows you uh, the, the size. Uh, the next uh, slide is the same uh, site. Uh, the pool is round with extensions of four steps each on the east and the west. Uh, the depth is 1.15 meters. One entered the baptismal pool on the west side and exited on the opposite east side. Uh, perhaps a symbolism here of leaving the world of darkness, the west, and entering into the world of light, uh, the east, from which direction the sun rises. A little bit later, baptistry in Ephesus is at the Church of St. John. The Basilica is 6th century, but the baptistry may have preceded the building and been in the mid-5th century, or it could be contemporary with the Basilica, which would put it mid-6th century. The Piscina uh, in the baptistry is round, as was the, the uh, font at uh, St. Mary's, but with arms, again, like St. Mary's, on the east and the west, but now somewhat smaller, uh, with three steps uh, on each side. Uh, the depth 
is 0.84 uh, meters. Uh, the next font is from the island of uh, Cyprus at Curion, 5th, possibly 4th century. It is in the shape of a cross with steps on the east and west arms. Uh, the breadth is one and a half meters, 1.53 uh, meters. Uh, the depth is 1.12 meters. In uh, Greece now, some of the Greek islands on Rhodes at uh, Phileremos, a 4th or 5th century uh, baptismal font in the shape of a cross, quite a large one, 2.72 meters east and, and, and west, so five and a half feet, by 2.52 meters on the north and south arms. The east and west arms have three steps each. Uh, the depth is 0.67 meters below ground and 0.20 meters uh, in its present form, at least above. So 0.87, nearly a meter uh, in depth and may have been uh, even more so if uh, more of the structure had been preserved. On the island of Kos, a baptismal font uh, near the gymnasium, possibly 5th century. On another Greek island, uh, Delos, we have a circular baptismal font, a depth of one meter, uh, probably, four, uh, probably fifth century. On the island of Paros, the Catapoliani church, fourth or fifth century, again in the shape of a cross, a fairly large baptismal font, the breadth is 2.95 meters, nearly 3 meters, so uh, 9 feet. Uh, three steps are on the east and three are on the west, again. Uh, the depth is 0.95 meters, one half above and one half below floor level. The pedestal in the center of the cross is a, a later addition, not part of the original uh, baptismal font. At uh, Corinth, there are four uh, baptistries. I'll show you here two of the fonts. At the church at Sincrea Gate, early 6th century, we have an octagon. Uh, 0.57 meters below ground, an estimated total depth of between 0.77 and 0.87 meters, entered by one step on the east and one step on the west. Uh, Corinth again, the church at Scutella, early 6th century, once more a Greek cross with two steps on each of the four arms. Uh, north of Greece, in the modern country of Macedonia, at Stobi, uh, there are two very well-preserved uh, baptistries. This is the one at the North Church, 5th or 6th century in date. The font is uh, polygonal, multi-sided, with cross arms, and the depth permitted water to reach between the waist and breast of an adult as uh, shown by uh, the, the mother who here who is in the font with her children on the outside. In the country of Croatia, at uh, Salona, uh, joining the modern city of Split, the baptistry was a hexagon. The uh, baptismal font here that is visible now is a second stage in the shape of a cross. There were two steps on the north side. In the first phase, the uh, baptismal font is dated to the 4th century and had a depth of uh, between 0.70 and 0.80 uh, meters. And Bob, that's Vlado standing in the center of the uh, uh, baptismal pool. In uh, Croatia at uh, Poresh, a 5th or 6th century 
uh, baptistry and we have a hexagonal uh, baptismal pool. There is a place for the baptizer on the west and uh, two steps on the west, a depth of 0.70 uh, meters. Uh, in Italy, at uh, Milan, San Giovanni Alifante, uh, joining the Church of Santa Thecla, now under the huge Duomo in Milan. The uh, baptismal font goes back to the time of Ambrose in the 4th century. It's a, it's a huge uh, a baptismal pool, a diameter of 5.16 meters, so over 16 feet, uh, octagon in shape. The walls do not survive, so we cannot determine the depth, but apparently built for administering multiple baptisms at the same time. Uh, San Marcello in Rome, late 4th century or beginning of the 5th century, a hexagon, uh, two and a half meters across, three steps gave uh, entrance. If you can exercise your imagination, you can determine who is the person kneeling uh, in the baptismal font. Uh, now at uh, Pisa, I show this to indicate that churches were still building traditional baptistries in the 12th century. But the font in the baptistry at Pisa, this adjoins the famous Leaning Tower of Pisa, but the font may have been earlier and go back to the 6th century. But this picture from the gallery uh, gives you a good view of the baptismal font in the shape of an octagon. Uh, now quickly some from France, uh, Aix-en-Provence, uh, first half of the 5th century. The baptismal pool is an octagon with two steps. The building itself, the baptistry, is also an octagon. A depth of 0.83 meters and a diameter of 1.6 meters. At Fréjou, 5th or 6th century, we have a round a baptismal pool set within the external walls of an octagon. There's a standing place for the baptizer on the west, uh, two steps giving entrance and exit, a depth of 0.82 meters. At the surface, the diameter is 1.38 meters across, but at the circular bottom of the pool, the diameter is only 0.90 meters. Well, this gives a cone shape uh, to the baptismal pool, and that was fairly common because it would save on the amount of water required. Uh, the greater width was needed only at the top when you're leaning the person forward. You only have to have standing room uh, at, at the bottom, so we have a cone shape. It's fairly narrow in diameter at the bottom, but quite broad at the top. Uh, now at uh, Lyon, the baptistry of St. Stephen beside the church of St. John. From the end of the 4th century, we have an octagonal piscina uh, entered by three steps, an exterior diameter of 3.66 meters, a depth of 0.86 meters. Well, quickly, a conclusion on the baptismal uh, fonts. As to size, the average depth is about one meter, which would have been approximately the waist of an average sized person of ancient times. So ample to immerse by bending forward at the waist, but the one being baptized could also have been seated on a step or kneeling. And as to the symbolism, the rectangular pools would have been the shape of a tomb, uh, a cross shape, which was quite common, has the obvious symbolism of a cross. The circle has been suggested to refer to a womb. We have literary indications that the waters of baptism were considered a womb in which the new birth occurs, but uh, no ancient source that I'm aware of connects that circle shape uh, with the idea of a womb, but that's 
one interpretation that modern uh, scholars have advanced. The hexagon shape, the six-sided figure, represents creation, and so death. Very common was the octagon shape, and the octagon represented the eight sides, or the number eight, represented resurrection and world uh, to come. Some of the baptistries probably had no apparent symbolism uh, to them. Well, I'm sorry we have run just a few minutes over, so we do not have time for uh, your questions, but uh, I'll be glad to meet you outside if you have some uh, questions you would like to make. Uh, my thanks to you who are the faithful uh, remnant. Blessed are those who persevere to the end. <laughs>